G'day Year 12 and welcome to another YouTube lesson. Again today we're going to be taking a look at the finance business function. Previously we looked at human resources and we've also in finance taken a look at the syllabus, setting out all of our students learn about and we've taken a look at the role of financial management. Now today we're going to look at the second subtopic of finance which is I mentioned earlier at the start of this YouTube clip, influences. If you said that, well done, you're on fire. It's important we know why it's an influence, why it's a strategy, etc., etc., because that's the theme that runs through each of these definitions, each of these concepts, because you'll generally have to explain or define what it is and explain how this is an influence, has an impact if it's influences, on the finance of the business. And you sometimes a criteria to evaluate the impact that's had. And for finance, we look at the five key objectives of financial management that we did last lesson. Growth, profitability, efficiency, liquidity, and you said solvency, well done. And we can see whether a business has done well or not. So what are we looking at today? We're taking a look at both internal, which isn't much in terms of the textbook and syllabuses, internal sources of financial management, mainly retain profits, and external, outside, outside the business's source of finance, which is debt versus equity. And there's lots of things in debt and equity. I know this stuff is riveting and you're going to be like so into it, but, but do your best. I'll try not to bore myself to death, let alone you guys. Now, again, I tell you why, that an influence is important. But an influence, why is it important? Look, an influence is something that has an effect, an impact on a business in terms of finance in a financial, financial way. A business's ability to be able to source funds, this is about getting money. Sourcing funds is getting money from a bank, getting money from selling shares, has a huge impact on the business being able to meet many of its key financial objectives. Let's think about some. In the short term, it can improve liquidity, get an overdraft. Without that influx of source of funds, it may be profitable in the long term, it may even be solvent, could even grow, but if it can't meet its liquidity objective, it's stuffed in the short term. Okay, profitability. It's vital sometimes a, bit, a business is able to source funds, maybe debt financing, maybe a debenture, so that it can grow, it meets that growth objective, and the bigger it is, the greater uh, chance or um, ability it has to generate greater profits. All right, so you can see how it's tying in as an influence with these objectives. Now, the two different sources of finance we have as options are, what do you reckon? Yep, you're right. That's if you got it right. Internal and external source of finance. Again, source of finance is where you get the, the finance from, where you're sourcing it from the, the place where you're getting it from. All right now, internal finance refers to finance such as retain profits. Okay, these are profits that a business earns that are then reinvested in the business rather than given to the shareholder as dividends. Okay, or you can use owner's equity. That's the money that the owner had originally contributed to the business. All right, that's that's all we're going to say on internal because the main part of this is taking a look at this external uh, part source of finance. Now, external source of finance, it's divided up in some different parts. You can have debt or equity. Debt, let's keep it simple, debt equals loans. It's not quite that, but it's easier to remember. Equity equals shares. Again, there's more to it than that. There's private equity for, you know, private companies, P2I, LTD. All right, but, you know, debt equal loan, shares equals equity gives you an idea what we're talking about. They've got their pros and cons, okay? And that's why when you're asked the question, which should my business choose? As my kids would know, it starts with D, depends, okay? On what circumstances are in a scenario if there's one, okay, what's most beneficial to the business and what they're trying to achieve. All right, so debt, we're talking about uh, two key ways to classify loans with debt. We've got the short term, Generally less than 180 days we often talk about, sometimes one year time period, but 
textbooks I look at talk about short-term debt loans is less than 180 days. Long-term loans are over 180 days. All right. Now, some of the short-term debt finance options to get money for your business, to meet that growth objective, to stabilize the business in terms of meeting liquidity objective, having that cash flow, okay, et cetera, et cetera, to increase profitability. You know, you have things such as an overdraft. So I want you to be able to define an overdraft and also say why it's useful. I'm not going to continually keep saying why each of these are useful because it's kind of the same thing. They're there, each of them, to meet one or more objectives. Depending on whether it's short term, it's more liquidity. If it's longer term, it's more solvency and perhaps um, you know growth and profitability of the business. All right, but you need to think in your head. I can define this, and can I say why it's an influence? How it's going to impact the business in a positive way? Maybe sometimes, fortunately, a negative way too. People can overextend their finances. Now, an overdraft is a business will be allowed to withdraw more money than they have in their check or savings account. They do this from their overdraft facility. So if I had five grand in my savings account, my business account, but you know, bill come in for 10K, 10 grand, am I doing okay or am I screwed? My liquidity is an issue. Okay, I can't afford to pay that. You know, my cash flow statement's going alarm bells. Mm. So if I had an overdraft account though, and it said, you know, sir, you're able to have um withdraw $20,000 without even asking us. It's an agreement that we've got. The interest rates are high, okay, but you don't have to ask any time you do up to 20,000. Well, I five grand I've already got in there in cash, so it's not an issue. My own money, the business's money. But then another $5,000 makes that 10. I'm still sweet. I could still withdraw an extra $15,000. Now, that five additional grand I withdrew is costing me, if I had a coin, interest much more than a mortgage straight away, but it allows my business to have some level of liquidity. It's very important. Next short term type of finance you can get is a commercial bill, also known as a bank bill. Money is borrowed from other companies that have additional surplus funds. They, it's done by the borrowing business's bank. The funds and the interest will be repaid to a particular person or business on a certain agreed upon date in the future. These usually have terms, which is time frames, we say terms to be fancy, of between 30 and 180 days. As I said, this short term stuff is up to 180 days. Now, it's similar to a debenture, but the main way at this level, you know, year 12 level, we're not doing, you know, um, university stuff here. The main difference is the time period looked at. If it's in excess of 180 days, it ain't going to really be a bank bill slash commercial bill, it's going to be more be a debenture, but a similar process. Now, another short term uh, type of debt financing we can get is factoring. Factoring is the cash sale of a business accounts receivable or trade debtors at a discount to a factoring company. It is getting another business to buy your accounts receivable debts and they chase up those debts. So that might to you sound all you know, what the hell is Sir talking about? It's pretty straightforward. I'm Bunnings. I've got a carpenter. Let's say she isn't paying me my money. Pay me my money, please, person. So what I can do is keep chasing that up. They're not going to pay. I can get a third party, a professional factoring business, like a debt collector, to go and chase that up on my behalf. I can sell that debt to them. She might owe me 10 grand. I'll say, all right, you guys give me 10 grand. I'll give you a $500 fee. So I guess they're giving me $9,500. I'm sweet. I don't give a crap. I've got that $9,500. It's not 10, but you know, it's cash in my, my uh, bank account. Good for liquidity as a measure, an objective. And they'll, that's their business. They're experts at getting that money off that, that tradesperson we talked about earlier. That's what factoring is. Now, they're the short term borrowing. As I said, you'd be riveted with today's lesson. I'm sure you're, you're stoked. Get out that popcorn. We're now going to take a look at long-term borrowing. And this is, again, debt. This refers to loans in excess of 180 days. Examples of long-term loans include long-term debt, mortgage, debentures, unsecured notes, and so on. What's a mortgage? 
think of, yeah, you know, I'll say your parents' house, your carer's house, maybe you're renting, but if you own or the bank owns the property, that's a mortgage. You know, some 70% of people who have property, they have mortgages. A mortgage alone is used to fund the purchase of property, generally land or a factory site. The property assets become the security for the repayment of the loan. Monthly, could be fortnightly. I used to play fortnightly before uh, <clears throat> I paid my mortgage off. Monthly repayments are made to repay the loan and also interest on top, the principal and the interest. Mortgage loans are typically very long term. <laughs> Don't I know? Some being repaid over 15 to 30 years. Some are just interest only and they seriously never get paid off. Although banks are starting to crack down on that and moving people to paying these loans off at least you know, under 30 years or 30 years. All right. So basically, if you think of your parents' house, but it could be a factory, same principle. They've probably got a mortgage out, which means that the bank um, allowed them to have half a million dollars or whatever, 10 million, 200,000, whatever it may well be. They get, the bank gave them that money to be able to pay the person who owned the property. They bought the property and the bank might have given them 90% cash coin or the value of the property to pay it. Now, the bank owns the title deeds to the property. You don't get that until you pay off your mortgage. So at any time, if you can't afford the repayments, the bank have to, by law, give you lots of chances to be able to continue trying to make repayments. But if you can't pay that off, you know, over, you know, two or three months, six months, the bank are allowed to legally, with an appropriate warning, sell that property to pay themselves to get that money back. That's why it's secured. Okay, and any money that's left over goes to you. If money's not left over, you get jack squat. Works the same with land or purchasing a business's factory site. Now, the next long-term debt options are debentures. Debentures are issued by a company for a fixed, locked-in rate of interest and for, again, a fixed period of time. They're generally long-term and they're in excess of 180 days. Companies that borrow offer, again, the security to the lender, usually over multiple company assets. It is therefore a less risky option than the one we're going to look at in a second, which is unsecured notes, okay, um, and will result, therefore, in less interest being paid. So with debentures and unsecured notes, very similar, but debenture, if you don't pay as a business, getting these debentures from other people, from, from money that the businesses have, surplus funds, you don't pay, they can, they can, like a mortgage, sell your assets to get their money back. So therefore, you're not expected to pay anywhere near as much interest. Now, unsecured notes are another long-term type of debt financing option. An unsecured note is a loan for a set period of time, but where it's different to the debenture is it's not backed by any collateral assets. So if a business becomes insolvent, it's unlikely or less likely an investor will receive any money. In the example but above with debentures, if they become insolvent, then it's secured against other assets so the investors can sell those assets to recoup their costs. Not so with unsecured notes. Hence the term, they're unsecured, they're not secure, they're not safe. Therefore, it carries a higher rate of interest than a debenture because I'm an investor, I've got a spare 100 mil, would I give it to a business issuing a debenture and unsecured notes? Again, depends. If I want to be a bit daring and I can get a much higher rate of return, higher rate of interest on an unsecured note, I might go with that. I want to be safer, I won't get as much interest, but I'll be a lot safer, I'll go with a debenture. All right, the last long-term debt option is leasing. And really, it's not, it's not really debt, but where else do you put it? And I guess that's why they've put it there. It's long-term, generally, so therefore it comes under this long-term part. It's not equity. It's not selling part of the company. And with leasing, you're also making ongoing repayments in terms of the rent from the leasing of the factory, the equipment, and so on. So I guess it's similar in a way to a mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. That's why they place it here. And in the test, you can talk about it as a long-term debt financing option. Now, businesses lease non-current assets, 
such as company cars, equipment, factories, and so on. This reduces the cost of purchasing or acquiring these assets as the business doesn't have to worry about that initial outlay of the car, the factory. So it's cheaper in the short term for sure. It is put under long term, as I said before, because it's from outside the business is external. It's seen as long term and it's definitely not equity. So in theory, rent repayments are similar to interest repayments. I get why it's there. Now, we've done debt, short term and long term. That's the one side. Moosing on, moving on now. So my kids say, when I'm a little moosing. We've got equity. This is a way to obtain finance for one's business by not taking out a loan, but rather by selling some level of ownership in the business in return for a capital, a monetary investment. Selling shares in a company is what we talk about with equity. Now there's ordinary shares, and this is one of the longer um, YouTube lessons, so I, I do apologize. Ordinary shares are what the general public can get hold of. They're the most common shares issued in Australia but their owners do not have voting rights at the AGM, which is the annual general meeting, and preferential shareholders do. These are institutions, all right? Uh, but that's all we can get. I've got, not plenty, but I've got some ordinary shares. They're the, the ones that you would buy if you're buying Telstra, ANZ, BHP, whatever. You buy ordinary shares, you don't really get the choice. Now, the major concern with these is that a business or a company, in this instance, a company becomes insolvent then preferential shareholders get their money before ordinary shareholders, of course. <laughs> the big end of town, you know, they get their money before you and me and the average investor. It does not surprise me. Now, there's a number of different types, four I think from the syllabus, of ordinary shares. These that I'm going through are all ordinary shares. They're all the ones that you can buy, like Telstra, BHP, uh, whatever it may well be. Yeah? tab and so on. Probably shouldn't say gambling. Gambling's bad, don't do it. Okay. Now, new issue is the first option. Again, it's equity. It's buying shares or a business selling shares. It's when a new share is issued uh, for a company when it's sold for the first time. I then now listed on the Australian Securities Exchange, ASX. As I said before, it's a ordinary type of share. So when Telstra first got floated, put on the ASX, listed for people to buy shares. They didn't issue rights issues or placements or SPPs, we'll get into it. They issued new issues. Now, the second type of ordinary share is a rights issue. A rights issue is when shareholders who already own shares in the company, so they may have bought them with the new issue shares or bought some shares off somebody who bought new issue shares with rights issues, you're already at present at that point in time when they're about to issue rights issues. They talk to shareholders who already have shares in the company and they say, would you like to purchase additional shares in the company? So I said, it's only available to current existing shareholders, not people who used to own shares. Okay, people who at present own existing shares in the business, the company. All right, it differs from new issue because the company is already listed on the ASX. It also is different, it differs from share purchase plans, okay, because in share purchase plans, um, they're only offered shares a percentage of what they already own. So if you own one share only in a company, that'd be ridiculous, but if you own one share in a company, then you won't be offered as many shares as someone who owns 1,000 shares, okay? Now, I'll go and skip placements for a second and go to share purchase plans and come back. Share purchase plans, these are again um, the same in terms of ordinary shares. They're offered to existing shareholders to buy more shares in a company without brokerage fee and sometimes a lower price than the current market value. All right. Shareholders can purchase a maximum of $15,000 worth of shares in a company. Now, it's different from rights issues. Okay, because it matters not how many shares the investor owns, they can still purchase up to $15,000 worth of additional shares. So let me make that clear for you. It might be a bit tricky. Rights issues and share purchase plans are similar. But with rights issues, if you have more shares, 
you can be offered more additional shares. You've got to pay for them. If you have less shares, then you're offered less shares. It's a percentage on how many you own, which kind of seems fair, I guess. Whereas with share purchase plans, okay, it doesn't matter if I've got one share in the company, or well, they usually have a, a minimum, but just say it's one, or if I've got 10 million shares in Telstra, I still can only purchase a maximum of $15,000 worth of shares in the company. All right, so that's not so fair, but it's about generating money quickly for the, for the company. They don't really care the company. Now, they're both open to, open to what we call mum and pop investors. They're just the general public. Placements is different. Placements are when additional shares are offered to institutions and other major investors. Not as we, it's an American term, but not mum and pop investors. That's your parents, that's your uncle, you, me, the average general public. I can't buy placements if they're trying to sell additional shares. Companies are allowed to sell no more than 15% of the total value of the company with placements. And as mentioned above, their previous type of ordinary share. What do I mean by institutions? Things like um, stockbrokers, um, you know, Macquarie Bank, uh, managed funds, they're the ones that are offered those. Sometimes it's quicker and easier for a big public company to just do that. You're dealing with professionals. So they'll often like to do that perhaps instead. Now, almost there. The last type of equity a business can get is private equity. This is for private companies who wish to sell additional shares in their business rather than the option of debt financing, which is taking out a loan. The other ones I talked about above, those four, they're not private equity, they're public equity, where they're selling part of their company on the ASX, the Australian Securities Exchange. And there's two examples of private equity that the textbooks give, I'm going to say to you quickly now. LBOs, leveraged buyouts, this is when a private company buys a majority control of an existing business. And the other type of private equity I'd like you to mention if you have to in a test, is venture capital, which is when a venture capitalist provides a private business with a large source of funds and acts as a silent investor in the hopes that uh, there'll be a high return on their investment. Okay, guys, thanks for listening. See you next time.